Hi, Ken, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great, okay, so uh, we're moving on to our next presenter this afternoon. Uh, lots of people in the business know Ken Shapkin, who has, uh, is a costume designer. And uh, Ken brings diverse experience, including costume design for both film and television, fashion styling for print and commercials, fashion show production for individual designers, fashion weeks and international fashion tours and manufacturing. Ken has over 50 projects under his belt and has made a name for top quality world-class productions. His work has taken him to Toronto, LA, New York, Monte Carlo, Nigeria, Budapest, and Shanghai. Good heavens, I hope you're building up points, Ken. <laughs> oh, plenty. <laughs> he has worked with such celebrities as Robin Williams, Sharon Stone, Dylan Baker, Timothy Hutton, Kat Dennings, Val Kilmer, Cuba, Cuba Gooding Jr., Christina Loken, and Genevieve Naji. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, Ken, well, are you going to be screen sharing with us today? Uh, I do have a couple of things I may share as the talk goes on. Um, okay, yeah. you're in control. So uh, I am going to bow out now. I'm going to be sitting on the sidelines here watching. Uh, the show is all yours and I'll be back in and whenever you, you wrap up. We've got approximately 15 minutes. Um, so I will see you shortly and over to you. Wonderful. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for showing so much interest in the film industry and learning more about how you can get involved and how costume department in particular um, is something you're interested in, how we can assist you in making that first step towards becoming a part of our team. So here on Vancouver Island, we've seen the industry grow. I moved out here from Vancouver about four years ago. And in that time, we've basically been working nonstop here in the community, doing a lot of uh, movie of the week, Hallmark type shows. Uh, I've designed Pup Academy and Pup Stars, which were all building clothing for dogs, uh, which was a lot of fun and had its own unique challenges as well. We did the reboot series on the island, um, which was a Canadian uh, series. Um, so we have a great diversity of projects coming to the island and we're really excited about the future here and um, our industry as a whole. And this, this industry, of course, needs people like you. There's so much, um, so much need for all levels of, of talent in the costume department, whether you are a sewer, if you love shopping, if you're just a great manager and organizer, if you're great with people, there's a position basically that uh, is suited for you. Um, like my introduction said, I've come from, it's probably over 15 years now that I've been working in the industry. I got my very start working, um, I apprenticed uh, with a friend who was a fashion stylist. So I started more in the print media world of fashion and from there got referred to a film set where I volunteered for my first show doing truck supervising. Um, I'll go over some of the roles and the positions within the industry as we go on. Um, but um, yeah, so from there I worked on in the truck, I worked on set, uh, I was a buyer, I became an assistant costume designer for a few shows and slowly worked my way up once I had a good understanding of the department to the design position uh, where I've really enjoyed uh, that role. Um, you know, as I said, projects are always different and uh, there's such a variety out there. I've spent a lot of my time working in kids television, which I love because there's a lot of color and uh, a lot of creativity that you get to bring to the set. Um, in, in, in some ways more so than sci-fi, but sci-fi also has a lot of great fun to it, breakdown and all of those amazing things where you're painting clothing and making brand new clothing look like somebody has been wearing it for ages. So again, those are kind of things that uh, we see in the industry and in our department on a regular basis. Um, I guess what I'll do is I'll look at some of the um, um, some of the different roles within our our department, and you know where you can fit in um, as a new person in the industry, 
and how to best make your way into the costume department. So let's do this. I have a little PowerPoint here that I'm gonna share with you guys, if I can. Um, and we will uh, look at the roles in the department. So <clears throat> here we are. Can everybody see that now? Yes, perfect. So within uh, the costume department and you. So within our department, um, of course, the lead person is the costume designer. So the role of the costume designer is what I do. Um, so we are basically given a script and we have to go through that script and develop the characters based upon what we read in the script. So uh, for us, we break down the script, find out how many characters are they, there are, and then our goal is to, um, you know, make each character unique and really show their character through wardrobe. So this is quite the involved process. Um, you know, we'll do sketches if we're doing custom builds and have that have from those sketches, of course, take fabric samples and present them to the network. And once we get their approval, we'll go ahead with the builds. A lot of the times on Movie of the Weeks, we're just using um, pre-made pre clothing from stores. So a lot of shopping involved and putting together looks for each of the characters. It's also very important to make sure what our overall view is in each scene. So once we have one character done, we have to figure out what all the other characters are wearing. So again, the designer is responsible for looking over all of those things, in addition to department head um, um, roles like your crewing, your budgeting, uh, your sourcing, um, all of those kind of things, and communicating with the actors, directors, producers, and really, it is our goal to, in many ways, we say we create the skin for the characters. So when an actor comes into a fitting for the first time, I often get feedback that this is the first time they're really starting to feel their character, because once they can see themselves in the fitting, in the clothing, they really start to embody that character that you see on a production. So the designer is in charge of all of that. We often have an assistant that is helping us. Um, so the assistant's gonna be our right-hand person. They're often involved in a lot of the same things. They'll assist us with the drawing, with the research, with the shopping, with the fittings. Um, they'll also schedule the fittings and arrange the rentals, make sure the flow of everything from shopping to returns is taking place. Um, you know, they're basically our right hand man. On a bigger show, what we also might see is a costume coordinator and the costume coordinator is more of our office role. So if you're really good at accounting and organization, but want to work within the industry in a creative department, this is a great role for you. We need somebody who can be doing our budgets, overseeing them, to dealing with the producers on a regular basis and our production manager, updating things as things are changing. Scripts will often be revised, you know, Actors will need more outfits, a network wants a more elaborate look. So all of that needs to be communicated, your budget's approved and moving forward. They'll also take care of all the, basically everything coming and going from the office. Any shipments, any ordering being done will go through the costume coordinator. They often, often are doing the scheduling of background cat or staff who are our background coordinators and making sure everything's arriving in the office when we need it to. Um, from that, we have our set crew. So the set supervisor is the main person in the costume department that is actually taking care of the actors on set. So because we're doing fittings, I'm not always on set. The designers often back and forth. I'll come to set whenever a new outfit is being established. So I make sure it's being worn the right way, the jewelry is the right, right for it, and that the producers and directors, if they're seeing it for the first time, are happy before it's going forward. Usually we'll have all of this in the bag and signed off through fitting, fitting photos, uh, but you still want to make sure those alterations were done properly and that everything is exactly how I want it to look. 
So your set supervisor takes care of all of that stuff on set, make sure the actors are warm, that they have cozy coats, that they're wearing their proper shoes, and that they're keeping track of the continuity. So we don't always shoot in a script in a script order. So we're often shooting back and forth. We're doing scene one and scene 53. So we need to make sure those cast are staying in the correct costumes all the time. And that is the key role of the set supervisor. Um, the person who supports them the most is our also costume truck supervisor. So all of the fittings, because we're always moving or taking care of in an area that we call the circus. So the fitting rooms uh, in the States, they call it base camp. The fitting rooms are wardrobe truck, AD trucks, hair and makeup, all travel to every set. So we have a truck supervisor who's doing all the cleaning, prepping the costume, steaming, ironing, uh, making sure everything is set out properly for the next uh, change for the cast and for each cast coming that day. So they're really the right hand person to the set. They're making sure the cast has everything they need before they're being traveled to set and they're overseeing all of that. They work very closely in doing the continuity as well with the set. So um, it's their, the set crew really is a strong team that work together. Now our costume buyers, uh, work out of the office and that's a role that when I didn't realize was even that something I enjoyed so much was shopping so shopping if you're really good at it and you can create different looks for different characters often we'll put together what we call is a costume a concept boards that we share with the network and maybe I'll pop to that in a bit after I go through these roles but the shopper will use that and we'll discuss what character they're looking for. If it's a worker, if it's a construction worker, we'll dedicate our shopping to different uh, areas and different stores based upon what the character is. So the shopper's doing that, they're renting, going to the costume rental houses, they're doing returns, they're picking up and dropping off to the alterationists. Um, so they're kind of our key person on the road, bringing everything back for the fittings so that I can actually have a good supply of a closet to, uh, to fit um, all of our cast with. Sometimes cast may have up to 20 looks, so we have to dress them head to toe for each of their looks. Now, when one of the good entry level positions in our dep department is a BG costumer. So now we, you know, with COVID happening, we're gonna have less BG background performers or, um, on set, but we still have to go through and make sure they're wearing something that's appropriate for our needs of the show. So what we'll do from the office is we'll send out on a daily basis to the background casting agents, what is required for the, the cast or the background performers to bring. We ask them to bring three options. We'll pick the best one. And if it's a specific role, like a bellhop or something, we'll provide that costume. And our background costumer is taking care of them on set and dressing them and everything of that sort. Now, the other roles that are kind of in the department, which are very important, are our build department. So cutters, stitchers, seamstresses. Um, if you're a very talented sewer, we need people like you. Often you're working out of your house, unless it's a larger production, and from show to show it varies how many custom builds we're doing. But for instance, on the dog shows that I did, sometimes we did upwards of 100 dog custom costumes. So I had a team of probably 17 costume department members of which we had about 10 cutters and sewers building individual costumes. Um, so every show is different, but we definitely need sewers and stitchers and um, the difference kind of between a cutter, if you have a bigger team, the cutters doing the pattern cutting and handing that work off to a stitcher uh, and then seamstresses are usually doing our alterations, which are always needed on the show as well. So um, to go back to me for a minute. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the roles that are out there. And some, like I said, some of the easiest ones for you to enter our department are with um, shopping and background costuming. Background costuming is where we often recommend that you get your start. It gives you a bit of um, experience on set. It's our junior entry position. 
The other thing that we often have that I didn't have on a slide there is called a prep costumer. So a prep costumer, if we have a lot of work to do in the office, is kind of a day call where you know, you're not a full-time member, but you're getting that experience in the office. Sometimes it's just as much as steaming all the costumes before we're going into a fitting with um, the cast members. Sometimes it's helping us organize returns. Sometimes it's doing breakdown, which is another kind of niche um, department within our department is our dying, aging, and breakdown. So on a sci-fi show where everything needs to feel post-apocalyptic, we're buying new clothing because often we're gonna need multiple numbers of the same jacket for filming, for stunt performers. If there's any bullet holes, we need to rig three squibs, which are the blood packs in jackets. So we'll have three of the same jackets so we can have multiple attempts at that shot and be set before anything. So we're not slowing down set in any way. So sometimes, you know, it's not unheard of on a larger show to have eight to 10 of the same jacket for one cast member uh, because of all the different levels we need. And then if this person is wearing it through a, the duration of a show and they're, you know, getting a bullet, they're falling in the dirt, we'll have different uh, progressions of that jacket and the amount of dirt and breakdown that's on that as well. And that's all handled in our breakdown department. So they'll be dyeing clothing, they'll be painting and aging clothing, and um, it's a very creative actually environment as well. If you're a painter, if you're an artist, a lot of people do quite like working in the breakdown department. And it is, even myself, I love doing breakdown when I have the chance to because it's, it is the artistic side of painting in our department. Um, so that's kind of the different roles that we have within the department. Um, so how do you prepare yourself to best um, enter into the costume department? So let's go back to um, this presentation. So preparing yourself, uh, schoolings and courses. So of course, the first entry point that we recommend for everybody in the film industry is taking the film orientation course at Royal Roads uh, on, the, on the island, or else it's also available in Vancouver. This gives you the general understandings of set etiquette, how to use walkie talkies, um, you know, film has very long hours, talks to you about the commitments involved and things like that. Um, but then if for other places you can look to prepare yourself, look at local sewing courses. Uh, Make House here on the island uh, has a lot of sewing courses to get your speed up. Depending on what position you're taking in our department, it's always good to be able to know at least how to sew on a button, you know, do little hems in case of emergency on set. Um, there's full course programs you can look at either at Cap College in BC or in Vancouver has an amazing costume department uh, film for stage film and uh, stage. Um, UBC has a uh, film production and design which does cover costuming but it's only an element of that. Uh, Pacific Design Academy has fashion courses, pattern making courses, all of those are going to get you in the right direction. I'm going to jump over that slide. Um, so where do you look for the job? I'm just going to, I know we're tight on time uh, and I want to get to some of your questions as well, but some of the resources to finding your first job in film. So for myself, um, I was like everybody who got a job in this film is you have to be very dedicated to breaking into the film industry and finding every which way you can. So the Vancouver South Film Commission has a production list and they have a posting board for your availability so you can upload your resumes and your work experience under the costume department once you have some training. Um, the DGC production list uh, which uh, can be found on the DGC Canada website or BC website as well, lists all the productions happening in Vancouver and on the island. So that'll give you the contact information for all of those. Send your resume in, attention to the costume designer, and they'll make sure it gets into our hands. And then Facebook groups is another great place. Like uh, I know there's independent film Facebook uh, groups for non-union shows. Also, all the film schools 
and theaters, get out there, volunteer to work on the costume department. Many times you're going to have to volunteer, but it's all about work ethic. So once people see that you're dedicated, that you're here to actually advance and that you're serious about this, um, then you're going to get referred to uh, other shows. And then, of course, once you have the experience, you're going to want to look into the unions. I'm a member of both IATSE 891, which is the Theatrical Stage Employees Union, and a member of the ACFC West Union. So both of those, you can check out their websites uh, for their requirements and what is needed to be in the film industry. I Wonderful. Guess we'll and thank, th thank you um, so much. Uh, there's so much that goes on in your department. Um, it's amazing to be keeping track of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got, uh, we've got a number of questions that have come in while you've been talking here. Great. Uh, let me see. Uh, let's start with a question from Janice. Can you give some examples of clothing that appear to be wardrobe when in fact they're actually a costume that you had to design? Um, examples of that. Uh, it's always tough. I mean, the dog shows, we designed everything. Um, that was one of the a good example of something you can't buy necessarily. When you think about the items you're buying for a dog in a store, they're all designed so that when you look down from above on the dog, you're seeing the details. So they'll often cheat a tie on the back of the dress shirt on the back of the tie. But when we were filming uh, Pup Academy and Pup Stars, the camera is positioned here on the dog. So the very small place between their shoulders is where we had to have all the detail. So each and every one of those costumes had to be custom built. Um, otherwise, it's usually period clothing. Uh, right now, I've been working on the VC Andrew series and a uh, majority of the things would buy a lot of vintage, but we'll also build you know, custom, Bayou looking house dresses for a cast that we needed multiples and to dirty because then we can't rent them if we need to break them down and age them a lot. So uh, a lot of the times the contemporary stuff would be the things that you think we bought, but we actually had to make ourselves. Make yourselves, understood. Um, somebody was asking, uh, what was it like to witness the comedic genius of Robin Williams firsthand? Oh, I was... So lucky to work on Night of the Museum, the last one, I think it was number three, uh, it was one of the first real big features I worked on in, in Vancouver. And I was working on set and was lucky enough to be dressing Rod about Williams. And there's not enough you can say about him. He would come on to set and just light up the whole set. He's just a genuine person. He'd talk to every crew member and share life stories and was just a real pleasure to work with. Ah, oh, I love to hear stories like that. Mm -hmm. um, and Andrew is asking, Ken, when you're conceptualizing an original costume piece, is there a standard number of alternative designs you like to initially present uh, to the people who ultimately make the decision? And how long can that process take start to finish? Um, well, that's a good question. I often find and I often say sometimes custom build pieces are easier than contemporary pieces in today's world because in the costume department, we find that everybody has an opinion on what is fashion and what is good fashion. So when you're doing a custom build or a period piece, yes, I often present multiple design concepts, like two or three, because you don't want to overwhelm with too many options. But then once we narrow down the look, then again, it's the fabric sampling. So we'll get, so, uh, again, a selection of maybe three different colorways of fabric that we can use on that build. And based upon what everybody else is doing, what the set is looking like, where the cast member is gonna be wearing that outfit, we'll then you know, decide what fabric's gonna be the best. And usually in film, everything is so quick. Uh, larger productions will have, you know, a couple months prep time, but a lot of the times we're working within a month, two weeks even, for wow. a full turnaround from design to actual wow. production. That, that doesn't seem like a lot of time. No, but you, you know, with a strong team, everything is possible. <laughs> and Suzanne is wanting to know, um, how helpful is it, I'm assuming when you go through and you're doing breakdowns, um, how helpful is it for the screenwriter to make reference to 
uh, you know, not necessarily as part of the storytelling, but referencing specific fashion details about a character, or, you know, thing like she's a chunky, funky jewelry fan or, you know, things like that. Yeah, usually what you'll find is um, when a uh, writer is referencing something that's costume specific, it has to do with the character or it's very important to the storyline. So if it's a necklace or something that was given in the scene, which would then become a prop, you know, it's very important because it's part of the storyline. Or if, if the person themselves is, let's say, a jewelry designer and they're designing chunky jewelry or they're a fashion designer or they're a fashion elite or they're a supermodel, they'll usually reference things that really pertain to character development and set that person apart. Sometimes we say just ignore all those notes because we're doing an overall look and there a writer won't always have that exactly dialed in. What they're trying to convey is a very important part that this, like say a bell bottom or something sets them apart from everybody else in the script. But then we might find with the art production designers and the directors that bell bottoms aren't really in style by the time the script comes to us. So we're gonna change that to something more relevant. Okay, understood. Um, uh, we've got another question. Is it possible to work up to a design position in costumes without construction experience? So this person has studied design and materials, but not construction. Is it, are, can they still get into the industry? Yes, oh, of course. Um, I'm probably a bit of a prime example of that. I have very limited sewing construction. I grew up in my grandma's sewing room and you know, made vests as school projects and everything like that. But when I went back to school, I went to school for a multimedia and web development program before getting into the fashion industry. Um, sometimes I even say that I'm probably not the strongest costume designer out there in the way that some people have a lot more technical drafting skills uh, than I do, but I still do design and sketch out my own outfits for a lot of, of the projects. But then I hand it off to my cutter who is very talented in that position. So it's always about the management of your team and knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are and what your team members' strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and then getting those people around you that can help you with what you are maybe lacking. So I always have a good illustrator if I need something to be at even a more professional level than my level of, of drawing and I'll empower them or employ them when I need them. And that's the same with the cutters. I'll be able to say, from photos and from my sketches, this is the design I want, but then that person will take and execute it. Okay, understood. Um, I think we may have answered this in your intro, but once again, how long have you been in the industry and what was the most difficult part for you to overcome in, in getting where you are today? Um, I've been in, in the industry for over 15 years. I think I started around 2004. Um, and what was the most difficult part? I think it's just uh, the hours involved, um, which wasn't necessarily something I minded. I'm a very much a workaholic and I often say, you know, I need to keep my brain busy because it's moving at such a rapid pace that in between jobs, I really, that's when I have a hard time when I'm not working and going 300 miles a minute. Yeah. Um, I love the adrenaline of, of the film industry and the creative world, and it's often deadline based. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, if you're that type of person, I think it, it, it's a good match and it keeps, keeps the energy and the creativity flowing. Great. All right, Ken, I think we have a last question here from Alejandro. Can you get a position on a union film as a background costuming or prep costuming as a first timer in the industry? Or do you need to show up into that position already having had experience or training? Um, I personally would not recommend going into a union environment until you have experience. Um, the unions, when it gets really busy in the cities, do open their doors to new members that maybe don't have as much experience. But what the union really is, is a professional union of professionally employed people. I started in independence and short films 
And the benefit of working in those first is that you get the experience and the understanding of what the department is. Because once you get into the union world, um, you're expected to know your job inside and out, and they don't necessarily have the time to be giving you first-hand training, whereas the independent world understands that a bit more and you get to experience it. There are times when, yes, you will get into the union and that might be your first job, uh, but then you really have to be diligent to put as much effort into it as you can because it's very important that you know, you're operating at the level of the union. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful and they might not call you back. Whereas if you have the experience of working on independence first, you're exactly. coming in with a knowledge base. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you for throwing kind of the... Um, the bit of a plug that way towards independent film because I can't say it enough that it is really, um, it has proven to be a, a brilliant training ground for most of the departments uh, within this industry. And uh, here in Victoria, Cinevic is one of the, um, uh, one of those organizations that can help anybody who's thinking of getting into the industry get some training so that uh, they can build up a bit of a resume before they start looking at the the larger sets that uh, that someone like you works on. Exactly. Um, and, and actually that's where we met was on independent set uh, Bubaloo. Bubaloo, yeah. Bubaloo, and now I'm know. working on producing my first uh, independent as well. So the good thing about this industry is you're always changing and there's always room to advance and there's so many opportunities out there that once you get your foot in the door, you'll be set for life and it's a great industry to work in. I agree. And it's all about building your relationships. So folks, if you're starting out in this industry, take care of those relationships. They, you will have them throughout your entire professional career. So exactly. great. Thank you, Ken. We're going to let you go now. We very much appreciate your time and uh, expertise and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Darlene. And thank you for everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye.